Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Mission Gathering's PRISM Faith Through Others' Eyes sermon series. Today, we're going into part four of this series, where we're going to explore the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as the Mormon Church. Over the past few weeks, we've heard from Brian McLaren to help us get an understanding of how to be Christians in a pluralistic world. We heard from Rabbi Jeffrey Summit about Judaism. Last week, we heard from Dr. Duane Bidwell about spiritual fluidity and what it means to be a Buddhist Christian. And today, we're going to hear from my friend and Mormon scholar, Jana Reese, as she helps us get an understanding of what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is all about. Now, if you've been a part of American culture over the past decade, you've probably heard something about the Mormon Church. Uh, whether that's from the Book of Mormon musical or from the HBO show Big Love, there's been a lot of talk and uh, this overlap of popular culture and this fascination with the Mormon Church and Mormon subculture. But today, the, what we have the opportunity to do is actually go beyond just the cultural stereotypes and learn a little bit about what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints stands for, what it means to be a Mormon. And before we dive into the conversation with Jana Reese, I want to give a little background knowledge. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was founded by a man named the Prophet Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was born in upstate New York and this was in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Joseph was a young boy who was very confused by all of the religious division in his day. The Presbyterians in his town of Palmyra, New York, said that they had the only way to salvation. And then the Baptists said that they only had the way to salvation. And the Unitarians said that they had the way to salvation. And so this young boy, Joseph, is very confused and his soul feels like it's in danger because he doesn't know which person and which tradition was right. And so he goes into the woods and he prays and he asks God to help show him what is true. And according to the Mormon scriptures, which I'll talk about momentarily, God the Father and Jesus Christ appeared to Joseph Smith in the woods and told him that none of the churches had the gospel's truth but that the gospel had been lost in an era of darkness and apostasy, and that God was going to use Joseph to restore the gospel to the earth. Soon after, Joseph Smith was told by a visit from an angel that some ancient scriptures from the ancient inhabitants of America had been buried near his home on this place called the Hill Camorra in New York. And so Joseph goes up and digs up these plates, and he finds on these ancient golden plates the account which he then translates through divine power and is called the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. And this account, according to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is essentially about Jesus' visit after his resurrection to the American continent and to the people of the Americas. So Joseph translated this plate, published this book, and began to spread the message of the Book of Mormon and this restored gospel. And soon after, Joseph released a number of other scriptures called the Doctrines and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price. These three books, the Book of Mormon, Doctrines and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price, were not and are not understood by Mormons to replace the Bible, but they are additions to the Bible. They help clarify what the scriptures say, according to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so if you are a Mormon, this is what your scripture would look like, quite hefty, a thick stack, and I'll talk to Jana a little bit about how Mormons use all four of these texts together. But the big question and the big thing that I want us to know as we go into this interview is that it's often been said that the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, by those of us who are in mainstream Christian traditions, we often think of them as something other than Christians. I think it's really important for us as we live in this country with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints growing pretty rapidly, that we understand each other as parts of the same faith tradition. In other words, Mormons are Christians. Um, even though we believe very different things about a lot of different things, even though we as traditional Orthodox Christians may not believe that the Book of Mormon, Doctrines and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price are actual scripture in the same way that we view the Bible, maybe if we disagree about what the modern prophet of the church says versus our understanding of scripture and tradition, we can still walk together as siblings in Christ across these differences. 
And that's really the point of this conversation. It's my hope that we can gain more understanding so we can relate better beyond stereotypes to our siblings in the Mormon faith. And perhaps as we gain a better understanding, we can work together to help build a more just and beautiful world that we know that God desires. So without further ado, I'm really excited to bring you this interview with my friend, Dr. Jana Reese. I, I think the first question is, um, what what does it mean to you to be Mormon? Or um, I know, also, can you talk a little bit in that first question, the church has just changed its official language usage. And so Mormon is actually not what you're supposed to be called anymore. You're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. What does that mean? Mm. You know, that question in itself is fascinating as someone who writes about this tradition as well as being a member of this tradition. Um, it's really hard to, um, to not use the word Mormon, and they have not yet provided us with any alternative that is just as helpful and Googleable and you know, searchable and usable as both a noun and an adjective. Um, yeah, we're still waiting for that. So I will, I'm sure, slip into the language of, of Mormon and Mormonism because it is still um, very useful for talking about the religion. When I'm at church with fellow Latter-day Saints, it's easy enough to use that language, but the language that, that the church would like us to use in talking about the church to non-Latter-day Saints is simply to call it the church or the restored church of Jesus Christ, which, you know, I find to be unhelpful because it is um, too generic on the one hand. It's fine if you say the church and you're living in Salt Lake City. It's not fine if you say the church and you're living basically anywhere else. Kind of begs the question. So, yeah. Yeah. It's something I struggle with. In fact, I mentioned to you that I was supposed to be in Southern California um, this past weekend, and, and the conference that I was going to be attending was actually all about the name of the church and what does this particular historical moment and this emphasis by the church mean for the history of the tradition and going forward what it might look like in the 21st century. Totally. It is fascinating. And it, I think one of the things that I admire about the LDS church is <laughs> it, there's this tension, right? I think with all traditions, but it is an evolving tradition in a very um, public way, like the council of apostles uh, and the prophet decrees that, Hey, this is the new thing that we're doing and everyone does it. Um, I, I kind of wish for that sort of pastoral authority. Uh, in my own <laughs> I'm sure that it would be, <laughs> would be very nice to uh, to exercise that sort of, but what a huge responsibility. I mean, who would want that kind of totally responsibility? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Can you just give for folks that um, might not have any experience with what it means to be Mormon, like the brief rundown for you of what it means to be a Latter-day Saint? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that you pinpointed something very important, which is the belief in continuing revelation and the idea uh, at the founding of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was that this young man, Joseph Smith, had questions that he directly asked of God and directly received revelation about. The church was founded on that basis. And the idea of continuing revelation as it has sort of coalesced through LDS history. It's not such a neat story that it happened immediately, but the idea is now that you have uh, 15 men who are considered to be the first presidency and the quorum of the 12 apostles of the church, all of whom are empowered to receive revelation in a general way. They're called general authorities so that they are overseeing the church around the world. One of those is the president of the church who is also called the prophet and emphasizing the prophet part of that role has become more important in Mormonism since the mid 20th century. So you really start to see that happen around the 1950s. Um, before that, the word prophet was primarily used to refer to Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, but not for the contemporary member of the church. And I think that's an important distinction in understanding how Mormonism has evolved in recent decades because that role is is now seen as exceptionally important and that the prophet has a unique relationship with God. 
And so for, for, again, people that might not be familiar, the church actually teaches that these people have the same roles and the authorities as perhaps the Apostle Paul and Peter and Christ's early apostles. Yes? Peter, definitely, uh, and the, the official 12. Paul is a maybe. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I wrote a blog post last summer when we were, every year in the church, we have a curriculum that is based on one work of scripture and for 2019 it was the new testament and i wrote a post about how mormons really don't know what to do with the apostle paul because he has this title of being an apostle and yet he's outside of the the chain of command that you know latter-day saints would recognize as being centralized and authoritative um and he's also this very irascible character who kind of goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with peter that's not something that mormons do you, you're just not going to see well okay Mitt Romney and Harry Reid, okay, they had their <laughs> moment, right? But it's really unusual to see that happen. Um, anyway, so Paul, Paul's a, an interesting question. Yeah. yeah. And you bring up uh, multiple scriptures. Can you talk about, um, mm -hmm. so the Book of Mormon is something lots of people know because of popular culture these days, but the LDS Church has a lot more scripture than that. Yes, right. And part of continuing revelation is the idea that there may be more scripture coming, and we hope that there is, you know, that, that the canon is not closed, it's not finished. There's a, a degree of excitement and also a degree of, I think, um, trepidation. If you, you know, if you think about that seriously and think about what it might mean, you'd be a bit naive to not have some kind of, of apprehension. I don't know, maybe that's my chicken little talking, but the works of scripture are the Old Testament and the New Testament, so the Bible together in both of its testaments, the Book of Mormon, which Mormons consider to be another testament of Jesus Christ, or a third testament, um, something called the Doctrine and Covenants, which is a, a collection of revelations to the prophets of the church, but almost entirely all Joseph Smith. It's almost all Joseph Smith, a tiny bit of Brigham Young, a tiny bit of, of uh, another prophet, from the turn of the 20th century. And then a few official declarations that have not quite been canonized as having the authoritative status of scripture, but are still con contained in the scriptures, the print version of the scriptures. And then finally, something called the Pearl of Great Price, which is a bit of a hodgepodge of several different kinds of revelations that Joseph had and were recorded during his lifetime. So four things. Mormons will talk about the print uh, version of the scriptures, which are kind of big and heavy as a quad. So all four of those things. Yeah. In high school, um, back when I was a fundamentalist Christian, I used to debate a Mormon kid in my school and his Bible would always outweigh my Bible. I mean, that thing was huge <laughs> <laughs> to carry that brick around. Whew. That's right. That's how you know you have truly dedicated disciples. But what does it mean now that, you know, everything is just here, right? Everything you need uh, from the scriptures and all of the talks by all of the general authorities through all of the years are basically available in this little device. So Totally. It's, it's incredible. A game changer now. You're going to have to get back with that guy and <laughs> find some other way to measure your, your yeah. sanctity together. I don't know. Funny enough, though, because that conversation leads me to this question. It's what I was debating um, my friend Jeremy back in high school about was whether or not we were true Christians. Um, obviously, that wasn't at that time, it wasn't so important for him to have that label, but it was important for me to draw the line and say the LDS church was outside of what I considered Christianity. And I, on the other end, was not part of the true restored church of Jesus Christ. Today, my thinking has obviously uh, shifted. I, I think um, anybody who would try to talk about the LDS Church as a cult or anything like that would have a really hard time by traditional um, definitions doing that. It's a fast-growing religion that spans the world, and it is centralized on the person of Jesus Christ. But do Mormons consider themselves Christians, and do you think that they belong in kind of that big tent family of what is considered Christianity? Um, yes, Mormons are Christians, and I, um, I don't find those theological discussions particularly helpful. I've been on the receiving end of 
of anathematization from both sides, from Orthodox Christians, uh, for example, being disinvited to a retreat that I'd been hired to speak at uh, because they found out I was Mormon. How they didn't know that in the beginning, I have no idea because it's, I mean, I, I co-wrote a book called Mormonism for Dummies. It's right there on my resume. I blog for religion news service about Mormonism anyway, but they found out about this and then um, I was disinvited to the retreat. And you know, that's kind of an extreme example, but there have been a number of other things where so-called creedal Christians, um, Christians who abide by the Nicene Creed, I think would, would say that Mormons are not Christian. We're not Trinitarian. So that's a major difference. Um, Mormons believe in God as three personages, but not a unified trinity as God in one person. Um, yeah, so that first half of your question was, are Mormons Christian? I think so, but yeah. I, of course I would think so, right? I'm not going to give my life to an organization that I don't believe is following the teachings of Jesus Christ. Um, so you should also read other people, right? <laughs> you, you should, you should uh, listen to the other sides of that argument. But the other part of your question was, um, maybe you could rephrase that a little bit. You said, are Mormons yeah. Christian? Um, in my experience, in my study and interactions with members of the church, there's yes, there's been this kind of acknowledgement that yes, we are Christian, but it doesn't seem to be the most important, like that label and that history of Christianity, because the church sees itself as the restoration after this great apostasy, right? Um, mm. So it, it, do Mormons, like when you're talking among yourselves, do you talk about yourselves as Christians or like, how does that language work? I just wonder. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a great question because the language is changing. And speaking as a historian, the language has not always been the same in how the church has spoken about its own role. Um, what is emphasized now and what has really been emphasized since the beginning of the 20th century is that this is the restored church of Jesus Christ. And that, you know, there's this great apostasy, as you mentioned, um, speaking also as a historian, I think that the idea of a great apostasy as a sort of bright dividing line in history after um, you know, three generations have passed away and then suddenly darkness descends on the world, which I think is how the great apostasy used to be taught in Mormon circles. It's ridiculous um, that it, it, it does not bear scrutiny from a historical perspective, but it does bear scrutiny from the perspective of what people feel that they need in terms of, of their truth claims and their right to be different their right to be somehow better and mormons are not alone or latter-day saints are not alone in wanting to have that kind of uniqueness you mentioned that this is a fast-growing church you know it's it's less it's growing much less quickly than it used to and it has not been immune from many of the patterns that we've seen in uh, europe and the united states certainly of people who are either simply not joining religion or who grew up in religion are, and are now leaving it. So um, it's not immune. It is still growing in other parts of the world, especially West Africa, for example. So we're still in positive territory. In, in the LDS church, we had 1.2% growth in 2018 and a little bit higher actually for 2019, which was good to see because before that it had been declining a little bit every year for many years. And then this was the first year there was a bit of a bump. Um, but still, you know, 1.2%, 1.5% growth is really not growth you want to write home about. And uh, <laughs> so that growth that, that pertained when you would have been in high school probably, um, where we used to get four or five, even seven or 8% annual growth is, is no longer occurring. So cool. it's an interesting historical moment to be looking at the church, which has really, in some ways, defined itself by that miracle growth that it used to enjoy. And now it's sort of looking at itself and saying, who are we without that? And there are a lot of opportunities that come when you're able to be introspective in that way. If you're able to set aside the worldly notion that growing like that meant you were blessed by God, which I think many people 30 years ago, 20 years ago, did in fact believe. Yeah. 
Totally. That's, it's fascinating. And it's also good to know that we're kind of all in the, these similar religious trajectories together in some ways. Um, one question that I've, I've actually been super interested to ask you for a while is, um, as my own faith has progressed from being a more conservative evangelical to a progressive Christian, as I would call myself now, um, my engagement with the Christian scriptures has become a lot more free. Uh, we'll say it that way. Um, honestly, I think it's actually more historically rooted in like the rabbinical tradition where you can wrestle with text and find meaning and it's not necessarily historically true. That's not the point of it. Um, does that same kind of engagement apply in the LDS church? And um, is there, are there like different wings and interpretations and like a progressive wing and a more conservative, like what does that look like? Hmm. Well, we don't have different uh, denominations within the church. The church is very centralized. And so, yes, there certainly are pockets of people that um, are on the more progressive side. And, and like I said, you should, you know, talk to lots of people who are, are are different than I am, and I'm on the more progressive side. But I think many conservative Latter Day Saints would hear my definition of the tradition and and say, "Well, that's not quite accurate, or that's not quite what we believe, um, or it's just not rah rah enough." You know, that I'm not enough of a a cheerful exponent of my faith, or that I'm I, I can be critical of it. Um, so it's always good to get another. Uh, another example of folks who have the same basic belief system. Um, when I met you, I think it was 2014 or 2013, we met at the Wild Goose Festival and we sat down and you interviewed me at a picnic table with all this noise in the background and you had your phone there. It was great. And you were, I think, right in the middle of that transition because you were still a student, right, at Moody? Or had you just graduated recently or something? I was still a student and got in trouble for all of those interviews when I got back to school. So, <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. so I brought you down, is what you're saying. I and, and all of the other progressive folks at the Wild Goose Festival, we, we dragged you into the, the literal yeah, mud. I mean, I remember that being a very rainy place. Oh, that was a bad year. That was a bad year. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, not just moody. I, I mean, the mud actually in the rain at Wild Goose. But um, yes, it was. It was but, cold and and uh, kind of joyously miserable, like physically miserable and spiritually yeah. awesome. Yeah. Totally. I forgot the question. Now I'm sorry. Yeah, Brandon, I was just reminiscing. No, totally. Um, I'm trying to remember it too because now I'm reminiscing about that. Um, oh, you asked about progressive Latter Day Saints. Yes. Um, yeah. Right. And I was actually supposed to be in San Diego this past weekend speaking to progressive Latter Day Saints. There are pockets, you know, especially in urban areas all across America, and in some cases also abroad. Um, so it, it is interesting. Yeah. No, no major schisms in terms of institutional division or going off and founding another church. Mormons are not really that interested in, <laughs> yeah. Totally. But So then what is it like um, being a more progressive person, uh, being a woman in this tradition? Um, because at least from my understanding, is it, still, it is very centralized. It is very hierarchical and one might say patriarchal. Um, and your writing and witness in the world kind of push in a more progressive direction, which, which would kind of be anti-patriarchal, which would kind of be mm -hmm. critical of um, institutions like that. What is it like for you to be able to exist in that tradition and for folks like you to have a more critical eye to the faith that you're a part of? Mm -hmm. Well, it's different now than it was 10 years ago. I've now been writing publicly about Mormonism since 2010. So I just had my 10th anniversary as a blogger slash columnist. And the landscape has changed tremendously in that decade. And uh, when I started 10 years ago, there really were not a lot of examples of individual Latter-day Saints who had a national writing type platform um, who could be faithful to the tradition, but also sometimes critical of the tradition. And some of the responses that I got were um, pretty seriously uh, angry, perhaps even a bit violent, 
and that was not helped by the fact that I was a woman. Um, yeah. It is a different landscape. You know, the church now has had time to adjust to the fact that there are going to be individuals who do not speak the messaging of the church, but are members of the church and are recognized as speaking from a place of membership in the church. And they've had to deal with that. You know, it's um, it's a changed world in terms of the, the media landscape that they expected from the 1950s and 1960s and 70s when the church really could control the messaging. One of the things that has been very interesting and, and hard, I think, for the church is that now that people can search out whatever they want to online about LDS history or, for example, the temple experience, which we regard to be one of the most sacred aspects of, of Latter-day Saint life, um, all of that is now available within five seconds on a Google search or a YouTube video. And so things that might have been able to be underemphasized, let's say, I'm not going to say hidden, because I think even many people who are making decisions within the church honestly didn't know a lot of the things that are troubling about our history from the 19th century and about Joseph Smith and polygamy, um, that was just not emphasized. And so where else would they have, have really learned that unless they sought it out? You don't have to seek it out anymore. And so the church has had to respond in, I would say, a pretty reactive way to in, not only independent voices like me who don't speak for the church, but are members of the church, but to this avalanche of historical information that comes at particularly young people without very much context and without a lot of, of help in them understanding it. And so they have had to deal with young people leaving the church who are, well, old people too, people yeah. might, but, uh, but particularly young people because they've not learned those things in church and they discover them in an un unauthorized way. Uh, and then the question becomes, well, what else have you not told me about who we are? And so there's a bit of a trust gap there yeah. that the church is now trying to kind of figure out how to navigate for the 21st century. It's not easy. Totally. Yeah. And on that, one more historical question here. As a progressive person, as a historian, um, so one of the central claims of the Book of Mormon is, and the church is that Jesus, after, I believe it's ascending, um, comes and comes to the people of ancient America and is here in our midst and basically teaches the same gospel he taught to the people in Israel in this part of the world. And... Um, Lots of folks, upon hearing that for the first time, would definitely raise an eyebrow and say, "Really? Um, how do you? Is that a faith claim? Just simply that is taken on faith, or how do you think about that just historically?" Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you're talking about is this kind of pivotal moment in the Book of Mormon, where after all of these different individuals have prophesied that Christ will come. He does. <laughs> so the culmination of the book, or the climax, I guess, of the book, before the denouement, when they all die, is that Jesus comes, okay? And it's beautiful. It is a, a really achingly beautiful portion of the Book of Mormon when Jesus appears. I guess that the Orthodox Latter-day Saint response to that question about, you know, eyebrow raising, why would Jesus appear in the new world, is why wouldn't he? You know, if the Book of Mormon teaches that the, the gospel is for everyone and that uh, the, the gospel will be preached in the languages and the tongues of all of these different cultures. Um, why would Jesus only want to appear to one tiny group of people in one place of the world, right? That makes actually less sense to me than that he would appear possibly in the Americas or in India, right? Um, something to ponder. So that would be a, a more orthodox pushback, I guess, on that question. We're not used to it. I mean, Christians and America is sort of a nominally Christian enough culture that the whole radical, scandalous idea of Jesus and resurrection, oh, you know, <laughs> that, that's yeah. what we ought to be raising eyebrows about if we're going to be raising them at all. You know, why not that particular scandal? Why not that particular story rocking our world? Mm. Totally. 
that's a good pushback. Um, and I, I think, yeah, something to definitely think about and consider. Um, you also brought up, and we here in San Diego in this community, uh, we live in the shadow of the beautiful La Jolla Temple. Um, and mm. I've spent qu quite a lot of time in my days uh, in and around Mormon temples um, in Washington, D.C., where I grew up, in Salt Lake City. Um, obviously, these are breathtakingly beautiful buildings. Um, and they really do seem to signify or point to something divine. Uh, what What is the role of a temple in the life of an LDS person? Mm -hmm. So we have our regular Sunday chapel meetings that are open to the public. Anyone can go to a Sunday worship. Well, okay, no, I take that back. You can't because it's a pandemic. Normally, you would be able to just show up on Sunday and, you know, anyone could go. Um, but the temple is for Latter-day Saints who have what's called a temple recommend that essentially is a card. I mean, you are literally a card-carrying cult member if you have a temple recommend. I like to t tell people, yes, I am a card-carrying cult member um, that testifies that you have met with your your stake, your your local leaders, basically your, your congregational leader and then the area leader who's over you and had an interview in which you talked about your beliefs and your practices and that that leader has, has judged that you are worthy to enter the temple. And what happens in the temple are several different things. So one is baptism for the deceased, baptism for the dead, which is a practice that Paul actually obliquely mentions in 1 Corinthians. And so there possibly is a, a New Testament basis for this. I think that's a bit of, a, of an apologetic stretch myself. But the beauty and the ambition of what Mormons are trying to do is to make the gospel available for all people in all times, in all places. And so what I was saying before about, well, why wouldn't Jesus appear somewhere else? The idea of baptism for the dead is very similar. So if the vast majority of human beings on the planet are not able through circumstances and no fault of their own to receive this message shouldn't they have the opportunity? Wouldn't a gospel of Jesus Christ be for everyone, even if they lived hundreds of years ago, or even if they lived in a continent where the gospel was not preached, etc.? So very bold, ambitious, Mormons are nothing, you know, but busy beavers. Like, yeah, you know, let's just save the entire human race on a Tuesday. Let's just do that, right? Um, so baptism for the dead is one thing that happens in the temple, and people can participate in that uh, is as soon as it used to be age 12 it's now age 11 possibly almost 12 which I guess I've th that's very recent just within the last couple of years so I'm not completely up on all of the changes um, for adults and for uh, well you you can have several other rituals one is called washing and anointing where you are symbolically washed and blessed so women are blessed by women and men are blessed by men um, you are then taken to something called an endowment which is an endowment of power the idea is that you are reenacting this cosmological story of creation of adam and eve and essentially assuming roles that will help you understand in the cosmic drama where you fit in and how you can be receiving the power of god and the power of the priesthood um, men can be ordained posthumously apparently in the temple i've never participated in that so i can't really speak to that but the other major thing that happens in the temple is uh, couples getting married sealed for all of eternity so sealed for time and all of eternity and that can happen for the living so particularly young people you know will get married in the temple although not now because they're all closed and then also for the deceased that people can be sealed to have their ancestors steal, sealed to one another by proxy. It's kind wow. of confusing. Yes, it's a lot to take in. Yeah, it is an That's ambitious place. place. Totally. What's interesting too is that if you go to a Sunday church service or if you watch what we call general conference online, which is just a, a meeting twice a year that Mormons have and they listen to sermons essentially and listen to the um, formerly known as Mormon Tabernacle Choir, now called the tabernacle choir at temple square um those are very informal low church kinds of rituals i mean general conference is scripted because they have it all down to the minute what's going to happen but there's no high church uh there's no you know smells and bells incense nothing like that 
nothing is in Latin. You know, ev everything is so apparently open and transparent in a ritual like that, that when people go to the temple and suddenly it is, it is this whole body experience and it is, you know, you, there is special clothing that people wear in the temple that represents the priesthood or represents Adam and Eve. Um, Mormons can freak out about this. So in my research, uh, interviewing young adult Latter-day Saints and also people who've left the church, the temple is a source of peace and a source of, of light for many people. And for some people, it simply isn't because they haven't had preparation for understanding that. They haven't really quite, and Mormons don't talk about the temple except in pretty oblique ways outside of the temple. And so that's, that's kind of an issue. Anyway. Yeah. Well, the last question, first of all, thank you for taking uh, time to be with us today. Um, this is such an insightful interview and I'm grateful for you allowing me to ask the questions. Um, Are you kidding? This is awesome. I mean, apart from my dog and, and my husband who's working downstairs, uh, we'll, we'll spend the evening together, but you're basically the first person that I've talked to today. So <laughs> this is great. You're saving me a lot of agony as an extrovert. So thank you. <laughs> I'm glad, glad to be talking with you after six years. But um, so the one thing, you're, you're talking to a group of progressive Christians. Um, what is one thing you would say to us about how we can better relate to and understand LGBT people or LGBT LDS people <laughs> in our community? Um, and because we actually, I mean, this is a fairly large, the LDS church is fairly large in San Diego. And I think there is a lot of fear of not knowing and difference. Um, how can we better relate and be better neighbors to LDS folks around us? What a kind question. I really appreciate where that's coming from and the desire that many people have to be respectful. There are many Latter-day Saints who want to be called Latter-day Saints. You know, I have basically said, I don't care call me Mormon. It does not bother me. Um, it's a it's a beautiful and proud history to me. But uh, one thing that people could do is just ask, is it all right to call you Mormons? Do you prefer to be called Latter-day Saints? Probably now, after President Nelson has made this an important part of his tenure, they will say that they want to be called Latter-day Saints. So that's a, an important thing to, to want to know. <clears throat> you could also just kind of have the conversations with them that you have been gracious enough to have with me today. Give people an, a chance to explain their faith. And I would say also give them the opportunity if they want to explore questions with you where they might not have the perfectly orthodox LDS answer ready to go, you know? because everybody's different. Even within conservatives in my church, I have some amazing conversations with people who have a nuanced faith or whose life experiences have, have brought them to a different understanding than they might've had when they were very young. Those can be really fascinating conversations too. And then I guess the last thing I would say is that Mormons are very interested in community service and in helping other people. And so, I mean, that's one of the things that I love most about the tradition. One of the scriptures in the Book of Mormon is that if you are in the service of your fellow human beings, you are only in the service of your God, essentially, that, that there is no difference between the love that we show to each other, like in Matthew 25, we are showing to Jesus. So serve with them, you know, find out what they're doing in the community or organize something that they can help you be part of, too, and get to know each other that way. I love that. Well, seriously, again, thank you so much for taking some time to be with us at Mission Gathering and for sharing a bit of insight into your faith as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Thank you.